Hello again, um, I'm back and I'm without a microphone this time because my batteries and things have gone. I hope you can hear me without. This will be quite um, a short video, I think. I just want to do a quick catch up with um, oh, where I'm at and book shopping from today. It's Thursday, it's um, early evening and God, today uh, the work piled up a bit and <laughs> I just had to escape out of the house. Um, I'm I'm in the middle of writing a book. I'm more than halfway through a new novel, which I've talked about a bit before, but I'm also in the process of editing two other books or receiving the editorial notes on two other books, which because of kind of publishing um, schedule changes, they're from a while ago, they're from two years ago, sagas that I wrote um, for a publisher two years ago. And now the, the notes are coming in and they're quite involved. Um, and I've kind of got to dig back down to these books. Um, well, I've got the notes on one of them and I'm going to have to uh, schedule proper time to, um, to, to get to know the book again, to make the changes. So that's been going on this week alongside getting the, uh, the proofreading for another book again <laughs> that I'm... I'm doing. Um, I've been proofreading my Doctor Who in Wonderland novel, which comes out this summer. So all those arrived this week with a very odd track, track changes. Word seems to be changing all the time, so the boxes appear in different formats each time, so it's a bit perplexing to make these things magically appear on the screen. So that was doing my head in slightly today, and my eyes were being done in by squinting at the screen as well. I've also been um, writing a book proposal this week for a future project that I hope will come off, as well as organising my um, new exhibition of, of pictures in a local cafe, which involves lots of fiddly things like organising um, frames and cellophane bags and, and you know, kind of really um, uh, tiny things that need doing. Anyway, lots and lots of work going on. And so uh, when Jeremy had to go out, I went with him and we went to Chalton and I bookshopped and I sat in a cafe and tried to forget all of this uh, busy work and, and fiddly work. And I had a fish finger sandwich and um, uh, half a pint of milk <laughs> and watched everybody around me because the place was packed, this lounge bar. Um, and I drew somebody's dog and drew a few faces and wrote my journal and looked at the books that I bought in the charity shops, because of course I had a pile of um, of books that somehow came with me. First of all, I'll talk through them. First of all, hang on. Um, two Viragos from the 1980s. These are um, gold dust. They were everywhere once upon a time. Now, uh, Oh, they're tr kind of treasured collections. You can see people have had these for years. Um, this kind of, this era of, of feminist fiction and non-fiction was so familiar. And, you know, we read them as students all the time. This is 86. Eileen La Tourette and it's Cry Wolf. A kind of, um, a kind of science fiction post-apocalyptic novel, I realised when I read the back. These were 50 pence each. <laughs> in um, a kind of community-based charity shop that I really like. Um, it's a bit scuzzier uh, than than places like Oxfam and things over the road. Scuzzy is an awful word, I don't mean that. A bit more down at home is a better way of saying it. <clears throat> but this is a post-apocalyptic book. Uh, Curie has inherited one world and created another a survivor of the nuclear holocaust and venerated by the inhabitants of the new world. She protects them for the, from the knowledge of the old, which she, only she now possesses. But there is one face, Sophia's, that shows no awe, no gratitude. Instead, her eyes say, we know nothing but ye, you do. It's interesting, these books of this time, they could go anywhere. When you think about people like Angela Carter or Sarah Maitland or Michelle Roberts, they uh, they could turn up, their, their fiction could be about any time, any place, any universe, 
and it was unclassifiable. It didn't fit into the usual science fiction or fantasy or historical fiction uh, moulds. And I loved that about it. And in Virago, they had a home for that. They were just doing their thing. <laughs> it's not as easy these days somehow. Um, and this is Benefits by Zoe Fairbairns, who was in um, the same kind of era uh, as Eileen Latourette. This is something that becomes, uh, if not science fiction, well, I think it does actually. I think it, it's speculative fiction. That's what it is. Um, it is summer, a heat wave, tense and easy days in the city. There are ominous signs of political turbulence in the dying years of the 20th century. I think it's thinking ahead to the end of the century because, of course, this was back in 79. Um, and it's it's about worldwide feminist revolution and um, the state and controlling um, fertility. Really interesting. Possible fu The all too possible future, a bleak world unnervingly rooted in the present ruled by the cold dictates of a super bureaucracy. There's nothing dates faster than, than old science fiction, of course, but there's always something to be learned from it. And I loved the beginning of this. I read this in the cafe. Summer of 76, chapter one. Reminds me a bit of Russell T. Davis's Years and Years, where he begins in the present and just veers off into his own future. Of course, that was a few years ago now, and the future he saw as being so bleak. It's kind of been superseded in its, um, in how dreadful things have actually turned out to be. <laughs> Not to get too, too bleak. Right, summer of 76. This is the beginning of benefits. It was a tall, wide structure and it stood like a pack of chewing gum upended in a grudging square of grass on the side of a hill. It was made of glass, grey metal and rough brown brick and had a depressing but all too familiar history. It was one of the last tower blocks to be built in the 60s for London families to live in. By the time it was up, planners, builders and social workers were already losing faith in tower blocks and the families that moved from the dirty, neighbourly streets being cleared around Colin Dean's feet did so without enthusiasm. So it's really from a very particular era. This is um, harkening back to a, a 70s that is still familiar to me, the kind of back of my head, the world of, of Peter Lee and, and uh, Newcastle and, and Tyneside being pulled down and replaced by uh, concrete and glass. It was new then, and from it, it seems that uh, Zoe Fairbairns is extrapolating a, a possible future. Brilliant. So that's adding to my um, stack of viragos that I'm collecting back up. Scabby Queen. This is recent. <laughs> I love that title. Kirsten Innes. It sounds really interesting. This is uh, the story of a one-hit wonder, a pop star, a political activist, Cleo Campbell. Lifelong love. <laughs> yes, love and one night stand. She kills herself in Ruth's spare bedroom and Ruth, practical as she is, doesn't know what to do. Um, as the news spreads, the story of Cleo's life spreads with it from the Isle of Skye to an anarchist squat in Brixton, from a yoga retreat in Greece to Glasgow on the night of the Scottish referendum. Half a century of memories of pain and joy and a peculiar feeling in between the two. So it's a kind of um, uh, telling the history of, a pop of popular culture and political culture through one person. Yep, it sounds great. This is from uh just a few years ago and i've seen it around and i heard it talked up 2020 not long at all yep and i was glad to find a nice hardback a nice kind of slightly battered hardback a well-read hardback because it's a kind of it, it sounds like a, a a serious take on um a feminist life within within a certain era it kind of fits in with the virago thing you know this is somebody who might have been published by by them in the old days perhaps it's fourth estate as it happens and as i've said before i've always admired what they do right a couple of more more recent things no well more recent than the viragos anyway everyone is watching by megan bradbury 
a name I remembered from UEA. She was one of our students. Um, round about the time I was leaving, I think, 20 years ago. This is a novel from a few years ago, her first novel. And uh, uh, yeah, it sounds really good. It's funny seeing names of people that you recognize in the back, that's nice. OK, this is a novel of New York, the story of a city. Um, in 1891, Walt Whitman is returning to New York at the end of his life, knowing only it can inspire him. In 1922, Robert Moses, the man who will build modern New York, stares out across Long Island. In 1967, Robert Mapplethorpe is searching for love, excitement and fame in the city of his dreams. And 40 years later, Edmund White walks the same streets, remembering nights of ecstasy and euphoria. Interesting that she chooses these men, these gay men, to tell her story through. Um, that's really interesting. So I'll be interested to, um, to explore that when I get to it. I love the idea of someone... Uh, it's a bit like thinking about it. Um, Michael Cunningham's The Years, where he takes three women in different eras um, and plays them out, interweaving them, braiding them together. One of those in, in New York, at least one of those in New York. And Emma Jane Unsworth. <clears throat> Hungry, the stars and everything. This is one, uh, it's a first novel, published by Hidden Gem Press in... Uh, Manchester, in Whitefield. That's amazing. Uh, I kind of uh, know Emma. She's a friend of a friend and uh, of, of of a few friends actually. And she um, of my friend Wayne. Uh, that's how I first knew her. And this sounds lovely. She's she's gone on to kind of big things since and movies and all sorts. Um, Helen Burns is a 29-year-old food critic with a big black hole in her life, but she has a lot to be thankful for, a great job, a loving partner, and an assignment to review a mysterious new restaurant. Alone in the restaurant, she finds herself embarking upon an extraordinary 11-course meal where each dish takes her back to a life-shaping moment in the past. There's a dysfunctional family home, so the, the novel is, is shaped by the, by the meal. Which is a kind of um, Virginia Woolf thing, isn't it? That like, between the acts or uh, Mrs. Dalloway, where the shape of some kind of uh, social um, occasion becomes the pretext for the unpacking of, of a whole life. All of which leaves Helen wondering whether she is where she wants to be after all. Yep, that sounds great. Um, oh, I've just realised the Hidden Gem Press is run by people I knew. That's amazing. Well, well done then. OK, and the last thing I got was this slim, funny little book. I think it's a reprint from many years ago, Graves as Garden Birds. When I was a kid, I used to love books about um, birds and wildlife and, and things where they had really lovely illustrations and fairly short descriptions. I didn't want long essays. <laughs> I just wanted to know the um, the basics about these things. Um, look at the J. Hi Socks! He thinks it's a book of recipes, of course. Yes, look, it's pictures of... He calls birds flying... Well, yes, he calls birds flying lollies because he wants to eat them all. These are all familiar birds from Come on. our gardens. There's a particular app you can get that tells you what birds you... Come on then, come and say hello. Tells you what birds you're hearing. And uh, I find that amazing, that you can just record a bit of song from the garden and it will tell you exactly. Of course, my big nana knew just by listening. And I recognise a wren and obviously a wood pigeon and a cuckoo and things but um when you hear someone kind of you know i love how characterful the pictures are um 
yeah, I, th I think I, I wish I remembered half the things I learned about natural history uh, when I was a kid. There's the poor wood pigeon, which we see outside the window here all the time. And they always sound so harried, <laughs> as if they've got an awful lot to do somewhere, probably proofreading or something somewhere. Um, Jeremy was laughing about, there's a one described as rather common. Yeah, anyway, it's a nice find, I think. Are you coming over, Socks? Anyway, that's my book shopping for the day. Um, I'm going to uh, uh, put this out on Sunday, I think, by which time I'll have been here, there and everywhere again. Hopefully my headache will have faded off from all this proofreading. I got the proofreading back, but I've got an awful lot of work to um, to schedule. I hope I've been loud enough without a microphone and I hope Socks wasn't too loud to drown me out. Are you going to come over and see people? Nope. He's looking a bit snooty, actually. Right. Goodbye, everyone. And um, please like and subscribe and carry on leaving your comments below. OK, goodbye. See you in the next episode.